Okay, so now we have seen various different mechanisms that can be used in order to actually activate uh, the tasks that are there, primarily the either the timer or the task itself requesting a sleep, right? Or maybe they are waiting for access to a particular shared resource. Interrupts also play an important role in how real time operating systems basically respond to external stimuli. Right? So, we already know what interrupts are. An interrupt can be generated primarily through external sources, right? So, it could either be a button press or it could be a timer or it could be some other kind of event that is happening which basically gets registered. It could be data coming in on a network card. It gets registered as part of the CPU interrupt processing system and it basically invokes something called an interrupt service routine. Now, how does that interrupt service routine get registered? That is something which we need to connect up in the interrupt vector table, right? The interrupt vectors are basically the pointers saying, okay, these are the functions that get executed depending on each of the different interrupts that we have. Now, there are certain general guidelines, the first and foremost being an interrupt must not be run long running, an interrupt service routine must not be long running, right? Uh, the moment I get an interrupt, I should be able to service it or run the code in the interrupt service routine as quickly as possible, right? I want it to be as brief and quick as possible. But what if it actually requires you to, you know, take a large amount of data, do some processing, make some decisions and then based on that do something else? You don't want to put all of that into the ISR. Instead, what you can do is you delegate the work to a task, a background task, something else that can actually work. What that means is I can now use the interrupt service routine to just pass a message to a task and then the ISR exits. Why is that good? Because now the ISR is now free. I don't have a possibility of an interrupt inside an interrupt or the interrupt sort of, you know, blocking everything else because it's of extremely high priority and so on. I have handled the interrupt, I have cleared it and now the background task can basically take the data and do something useful with it, right? So this is generally something called deferred interrupt handling. The ISR handles the interrupt but the actual work is deferred or postponed to a separate task. There are multiple ways in which we can do this. Uh, one of the methods would be using semaphores, right? Where what we do is in the ISR, I give a semaphore, right? And in fact, there are sort of, uh, you know, specific uh, functionality which allows us to give a semaphore from an ISR, right? Which sort of makes sure that the ISR has access to the semaphore and therefore has the ability to give it in the first place, right? If the ISR in turn had to sort of take the semaphore and wait for it in some way, that would be a bit of a problem, right? So, this giving from the ISR basically is sort of a guaranteed, it's a one-way uh, approach where the ISR is allowed to give access to a certain resource or, you know, give, it, it's essentially sort of passing on something to this task over here, which can in turn wait for that semaphore. It basically sits here waiting for the semaphore take to succeed and the moment it succeeds, it actually performs the deferred processing, right? Another way would be, you know, just get the data and pass it on in a queue. Right? This does involve a little bit more work because the getting the data itself might be something that actually takes time. But if it's not and it's just a question of maybe reading a value from an A to D converter or from a network card or from a UART and just passing it, you know, sending it into the queue from the ISR, right? The task can in turn just wait for queue receive and as soon as there is some data sitting in there, yes, process the data, right? Do all the slow computation out there. So, both of these as you can imagine are sort of you know mechanisms that we have just talked about synchronization as well as communication that can be used. Effectively what we are saying is the ISR by itself is doing something very simple. It handles the ISR, it handles the interrupt, it clears the interrupt and says okay you know things are going back to normal but it also alerts some other task that look there's work for you to do. I am posting the information here, please pick it up from this queue or you know take this semaphore and do something useful with it. Right? And a third approach which is once again related to the idea of communication between tasks is there is explicitly something called a notification. Right? Uh, 
So a notification is something simpler than a queue. In a queue, we actually have data being transferred, whereas a notification is just sort of, you know, a signal saying, hey, something happened, an event happened, right? And in this case, basically the task waits for that uh, notification. And anytime the notification comes, right, it performs deferred processing. It as you I mean, presumably whatever data that was required has already been saved somewhere in some kind of shared memory or uh, global variable such that this my task function can actually access it and do something with it, right? But the actual communication between the ISR and my task is now reduced to a simple notification. In some sense, it's a form of communication. If you think about it, semaphores and queues are also a form of communication. It's just about how much complexity is involved in each of these cases and complexity meaning that how many clock cycles are going to be taken to actually execute the code corresponding to this, right? So because of that is why we have multiple different mechanisms for doing all of these uh, different approaches. All right, so finally what we are going to do is look at a small example, right? What I am going to do is show you the code which basically implements some kind of a complex task and the idea is to sort of think about, you know, if you were to design a larger system, how would you go about using an RTOS in order to actually break it up into different tasks, each of which has a specific responsibility and those different tasks need to sort of, you know, communicate or balance between each other in order to get the overall work done. So the task that we are going to look at will be that we will have a sensor task that basically simulates reading a sensor value and put, pushing the data into a queue. Okay. There is going to be a processing task that accesses data from the queue and processes it, but it does not do it every time there is data sitting in the queue. Right? The processing task in turn waits for an external event. Right? Let us say that we are looking for a button press. Right? And only when there is a button press that is actually going to happen, will the processing task actually wake up and perform its work. Okay. And something that we have not discussed uh, over here, but can also be done is that there are certain issues related to memory allocation and so on in an RTOS and an RTOS provides you with custom functionality for that, right? Uh, which basically allow you to decide where different variables get uh, mapped and how much memory is available in the system and so on can also be identified as some function calls within the RTOS itself, right? So what I'm going to do now is just look at what a code for an example like this. This is a completely artificial example, but you can sort of relate it to potential, you know, real life scenarios and see how, you know, accessing data from a sensor, collecting it into a queue or a buffer and then processing it as in when certain events happen could be implemented with the support of an RTOS. So the code for this entire system looks something like this, right? Um, you can imagine that, you know, there are a lot more header files over here. There is a task header file, there's a queue, there's a semaphore, there's a timer, right? And apart from that, we also have certain things which we are still using the, you know, loop and setup kind of structure. It could have been written using the main function in uh, the uh, regular C program, but since we are using the Arduino, we are sticking with this. You can see that there are a few global variables that are defined over here, right? The queue, for example, is a global variable. The semaphore that's going to be used for communicating between two tasks is also uh, global. And there is a timer, which is a global, right? There are some macros that are basically parameters, right? One of them is the queue length, which is five. The stack size is something related to the memory management in the system. Again, something that we have not really looked at in detail, but there are functions in there that allow you to, you know, have different kinds of uh, uh, memory allocation, dynamic allocation as required at runtime. Okay, so what does the overall system look like, right? Uh, in the setup, you can see that we first start the main routine. We attach an interrupt. Okay, so what does this attach interrupt do? It's once again something provided as part of the Arduino uh, libraries. And in this case, what we are saying is I have a push button. I'm connecting it on one side to pin number two of the Arduino. 
and on the other side to the ground pin. Okay. Uh, every time I push this button, I can sort of uh, what is going to happen is that this pin 2 is going to get pulled down to ground. Okay. And so what we say is the falling edge of that transition, that is to say, when this signal gets pulled down to ground, right, is when the interrupt is going to be triggered. So, this digital pin to interrupt basically says that register an interrupt handler for this pin, pin number 2, falling edge, that is to say, when it goes from 1 to 0, right, which in turn means, of course, that you know by default this pin 2 should have been pulled up to ground, right. Otherwise, if we did not have a pull up over here, it would mean by default that I don't know what the state is, is it high or low, right. But if I do have a pull up, then every time I push this button, right, I should see that this value goes down to ground. And if I release the button, I should find that the value goes back up to VDD or whatever is the digital voltage supply. And what this function attach interrupt says is whenever there is an interrupt on pin number 2, call VISR handler. What is VISR handler? It is one of the functions that we have written and we will look at that in a moment. We also create a queue with queue length which was defined as 5 over here, integers as the capacity. Okay, And of course, you know, generally good practice while writing any program, you should always check the return state of every function call. Right? In other words, if the queue could not be created, you should actually sort of catch that as an error and respond to it. Right? Very often we tend not to catch or not to look for all such errors and that is not good programming practice. This is just you know simple and clean which basically says first try to create the queue and if it failed then immediately get out of this function. You have to stop. You can't really do anything. In this case this is not quite correct. It says return 1 right but setup is of type void. So return 1 does not really make sense in this context. But okay, let's. It should just be a return over here. Similarly, create the semaphore, right? Uh, I'm creating a binary semaphore, which basically says either I take or I don't take. I don't have a count. I don't keep increasing it up to a count. So I don't have to specify the number of possible entries in the uh, semaphore. Then I create the tasks, right? There is a sensor task which we will look at in a moment the, and there is a processing task and finally I start the scheduler. Now the interesting thing is in a lot of uh, programs you will actually find that or uh, embedded programs you will find that there is some comment out here with a for or a while one loop saying the program should never reach here right. Well that is a fact the program should never reach here because once the scheduler starts it is itself supposed to be an infinite loop it is never supposed to come out and come through to the end over here. And similarly you will also have a return it should not be a return 0 like I said you know that is actually a mistake this function is of type void it should just be a return right uh, but that is ok we are just ignoring that for now. Both of these should never get encountered in practice. But it is common to actually see this in embedded code, right? And in fact, sometimes you will even have a print or some kind of an error message print over here, which says actually print something if you get to this point, okay? Now, the utility of that is uh, debatable because you should never hit there, uh, hit this point. And if you do, then it's unlikely that your UARTs or console or whatever it is, is actually functional either. But it's more a sort of, you know, safe practice just to put it in there. All right, so now let us look at the tasks that we have created. As we know, we have two tasks, a sensor task and the processing task. What the sensor task is going to do is basically simulate reading from a sensor, just generate some random data, right, print it out over here and send the data into a queue, okay. So that is all, it just does that every one second and then it goes back to sleep for one second, okay. So the sensor task is going to read generate some random data once every second and try to re write that out into a queue. What about the processing task, right? Uh, the processing task, interestingly enough, it first waits for a semaphore, right? It does not just try to receive data from the queue, okay? Now this has an interesting impact. Basically what it says is where is the semaphore coming from? I do not know yet. I will have to look into that. 
If I did not wait for the semaphore, what I would do is any time that data has been written into the queue, I would process it. And in this case, just you know, print out processing task and print the value that got processed. But because I am waiting for a semaphore, as you can see in the comment above here, I am actually waiting for the ISR to tell me go ahead and process. Right? So the semaphore in turn is coming from the ISR handler. Right? And what it says is that whenever the ISR is invoked, it's just going to give the semaphore from the ISR. Okay. Uh, this port yield from ISR and so on is just standard code which is required to handle the scenario where higher priority tasks uh, could come in. What is important over here is the X semaphore give, right? So what the ISR does is it basically gives a signal. It's an artificial, you know, uh, example that we are creating over here. You did not really need this, but you could have, but what this allows us to do is model, for example, a place where sensor data comes in. I don't always process it until some condition has been satisfied. In this case, what is the condition? The ISR got invoked. How is the ISR going to get invoked? When I push the button. Okay. So let's start running this, right? And what you can see is I start running it and it basically says sensor task, it has started reading. And you can see that, you know, it printed up to this point and now it's basically stopped. Okay. It was supposed to be write, writing something once every second, but what has happened is the queue filled up, right? Uh, because the queue had a size of five. And the queue filled up, which means that the sensor task has actually blocked because it cannot write into the queue. The processing task has never got a chance to run because it's still waiting for the semaphore. How do I give it the semaphore? Click the button. And you can see that the moment I click the button, it basically runs through and processes all the data that was sitting in the queue. Now you might wonder, okay, you said the queue size was five, but it has six values. That's typically because there is one last value which is ready but is not yet written into the queue but is just sitting over there waiting to be written as soon as space frees up in the queue okay so once again it blocks after getting another five values right once again i press the button it immediately processes all five of them but now you can see that if i press the button you know more often it will process the data as and when they are present over there in other words the isr is waking things up and you know getting things ready for me as and when needed. But if I wait, allow the queue to fill up, at one shot it will process all of those once again after that. Okay. So the purpose of this example was to show you how you could maybe construct a larger system involving sensors, processing, interrupts and tie them all together by using the facilities provided by an RTOS. Right? This works on the Arduino using the Arduino FreeTOS, uh, FreeRTOS library, but pretty much exactly the same code with probably minimal changes should also work on an STM32 where you have got the FreeRTOS libraries ported onto it or some other ARM processor, right? And that essentially is the power of the OS, right? By providing a neutral or common set of programming interfaces, APIs, right? It allows you to write code in such a way that you can stop worrying about which processor or which kind of system you are actually working with and write code at a higher level of abstraction. 